Welcome. And get yourself settled in this space. Thank you. Once you get your journal out and get yourself situated, just take a couple of good deep breaths. Whatever is happening outside your world, outside the world of this room, is going to just keep on going. And we can be in this moment right now, which is really lovely. Be here now. And the best way to do that is to take a couple of deep breaths. Even though we continue to wear these masks, breathing is still really good. And thank you for continuing to wear your masks properly. Um, we need to just continue to think about safety. So we'll start with a couple of announcements as usual. Um, just some things to be aware of this week. First is another extra credit movie is coming up on Wednesday, March 15th. The Lost Bird Project movie. It's a project, um, it's about art, it's about conservation, it's about creativity. It's about one artist's way of making his point, making his way in the world, helping others to be aware. Um, you'll get to see one of these magnificent sculptures by this artist when you come out to Shavers Creek for your field trip on April 10th. You'll see one of the Lost Bird Project sculptures there. There's also one by the Hintz Alumni Center. The Labrador Duck is there. They're these like big as me sculptures that are really quite stunning. So this project, this movie, um, follows the artist and his dream of awareness and connection and how he's making, making his mark on the world. It's a beautiful example of how one person can, can make change. Yes? Oh, you're so good. Thank you. Beautiful, silly, thank you. It is on Wednesday, really, which is March 16th. That's my error, I'm sorry. Wednesday, March 16th. Sorry about that. So that's coming up. This week, your assignment in your journal is, um, is to do something physical. Uh, to, you have some choices uh, in this week's uh, action assignment. Um, the first one is you have the opportunity to make something. So I don't want you to go out and buy a lot of supplies for this. I want you to consider what you can do with what you have. Or if you have makers in your family, woodworkers, knitters, crocheters, painters, whatever it might be, I'm inviting you to make something. Okay. The other, the next choice is, oh, these are websites that might help you if you have an inspiration or if you're curious about, you know, what's it, how do you crochet? Or how do you, whatever it is, you can find websites that are helpful to you on that. Um, your TAs can help and answer questions about this assignment as well. Um, the next choice is that you can repair something. If you have something that is ripped or something that is broken, you can make it usable again. Um, so that's an option. So really putting your mind to fixing something. You can also upcycle something, take something that's used, maybe something that you don't use in its current form anymore, and then upcycle it into something else that you will use. Or these could be, if you're starting to think about, you know, what the heck do I need? And you can't think of something you need, but maybe 
Maybe you end up making something for your mom for Mother's Day and then you're just ahead of schedule, right? So if it helps you, it all, almost always helps me in, be inspired if I can think about making something for somebody else, um, creating a gift. So if that helps you to be inspired for this project, that's cool too. Again, your TAs can answer questions for you um, about, this, about this assignment if you're struggling or if you're curious. Um, so those are, those are some, some possibilities. What you're gonna do is through this week, you're gonna be creating it, you're gonna be journaling about it, about the creation of it, about how you got the idea, your inspiration, and then you're gonna have two weeks really to finish it um, before you bring it to show to your week 11 lab um, and sort of present your project, whatever you made or fixed or upcycled. So you'll bring it as a, as a show and tell in week 11. All right, and so then getting into this week, I found this to be inspiring. There's a, an artist in the Ohio River region. His name is John Sabra, and he does art like this. And these are all pigments that he has made out of the toxic runoff in his area. The chemicals that have been put into the rivers in the Ohio region, he then distills those and creates art. And so it's another way of matching this awareness to his creativity, um, to then creating awareness in other people, teaching and sharing with other people. So we're gonna continue this theme of awareness today, um, the theme that we're all connected, the theme that we are all individuals and bring cool stuff to the world in our very unique ways. Um, and yet, we are a collective. We are all in this together, right? This challenging part of part two of the course that we're in. So we've talked through this the, uh, a couple of times, and you'll continue to see this because I think it's really powerful. The idea that we can't keep doing things the way that we're doing it. We have to make change. And I understand that this part two is so different than part one. And I'm hearing from some of you, I'm hearing from your TAs, and I feel it in my own gut that this part of the course sucks in some ways. It's hard. This is hard news. But it's also my job to tell you about what's going on. So if you think back to the birds class, three billion birds lost, and then the climate change class and the oceans class, those are hard, incredibly hard things to talk about. Through this part two of the course, I spend a lot of time having an upset stomach, feeling a lot more anxious, because I'm doing all this research about what's going on so that I can come and share that with you. And because I care, it really gets me. It gets me every time. Um, and it affects me in all the time through these days. Uh, so I'm getting that, that that's happening for a lot of you too, um, that you are affected by this bad news section. But we have awareness. We have the opportunity to become more aware, and then we have the opportunity to do this, to make choices. So we're gonna do that, we're gonna proceed. So today's topic is chemicals. So just talking about John Sabra and the chemicals that he's painting with, creating art with. Chemicals, the, the most important thing or an important thing to notice or talk about is that chemicals are everywhere. As we look around this room, you know, the, the chairs that you're sitting in are made of chemicals. The, the water bottle that you're carrying is made of chemicals. And in fact, we've talked about the water that's in your water bottle. Water is a chemical, H2O. And the fact that we are made of chemicals, right? 
So when I say today we're going to talk about chemicals, what we're doing is really defining chemical not as a bad thing, but we're going to be talking about things that are hazardous to our health. It's also really important to note that some of the most, some natural things in the natural world are some of the most toxic things to us that are, that are come from the natural world. And so there are cases where synthetic things are better than the natural ones. Um, I found the example that melatonin as a, as a uh, supplement, sometimes people take melatonin to sleep. It's healthier for us to take a synthetic melatonin because the real natural melatonin found in nature can sometimes carry viruses that are actually hurtful to us. So there are ways, there are times that the synthetic stuff is better than the natural stuff. And then sometimes synthetic chemicals are better for the environment than the natural. And so like the flavoring vanilla, vanilla is becoming, it comes from a, a pod. It's a very rare flower, comes from a pod that grows in very closed, very remote locations like in Madagascar and other places. And so, Using imitation vanilla is actually better for our environment than using natural vanilla. So chemicals can be really complex. But what we're gonna do today is think about harmful chemicals, the things that are in our environment that are harming us, maybe whether we know it or not. So take a moment and jot down on your paper three places where you personally encounter harmful chemicals. And then once you get a few on your list, compare your list with your neighbor's list and chat about it for a couple minutes or for a minute. All right, I would love to hear some of the stuff that you have. What's on your list? Where are harmful chemicals in your world? Yeah. The Hudson River. So places close to your home, 
We've talked about the whole New York City trash thing, um, the Hudson River. So that's close to home, probably affecting your drinking water supply. Um, swimming pools and like the chlorine that's in it. Oh, chlorine, swimming pools. Yep. Mm hmm. That's a good one. Hadn't thought too much about that, but I will. Yeah, now. Yes. Secondhand smoke. Oh, secondhand smoke. Yep. And firsthand smoke. Yeah. Chemicals. Where else? Yes. Makeup, that's interesting. Yeah, we're gonna touch pretty in depth on that today. Yes. Oh, uh, I said when I'm driving on the highway and I'm near like a bus or a truck, the diesel exhaust that you breathe in from yep. those vehicles. For sure, the exhaust of cars and trucks. Yes. Um, the hair salon with like hair, hair dye and stuff. Hair like salon bleach. and nail salons, yep, hair dye. Yep, all those chemicals, yep. Mm -hmm. um, I eat a lot of fruit, so like stuff they could spray on that, like the pesticides. Yep, pesticides and herbicides on our crops. So many, yes. Uh, in many workplaces with cleaning supplies. Oh, cleaning supplies, that's important to consider. Yep. In the workplace and at home, really, depending on choices. Yes. Go ahead. I worked in a factory over winter break and I don't really know what I was breathing in, but I got sick. Oh, scary. <laughs> yeah, oh, I feel for you. Yes, how about one more? Go ahead. Oh, two more. We also said like in our food, that could be like preservatives and stuff. Preservatives in our food, yep, exactly. Is there another one? All right. That is a pretty good list. You all hit a bunch of them, um, and even more than what we'll talk about today. But things that require your research. So if it, if you are, you know, if you're concerned about the chemicals in the swimming pools, if you're wondering what's happening in that factory, then it's they need to tell you what the chemicals are. There are laws about both of those things that that there should be controls on them, and then also they need to be forthcoming with the information about what's in there. So exercising your curiosity um, and your choices in order to figure those things out. So where you, can, where you find things that you care about, you can investigate those things. Um, so we're gonna touch on a few of these today. Of course, you know that if, if you are in a closed space with car exhaust for even a few minutes, you die. The benzene um, and all of the other things that are listed here, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides, hydrocarbons, car exhaust is, is, our, is one of our number one pollutants. Um, so that's a huge thing to consider. And we will do a whole class on transportation, so I'm not gonna linger on this one today. But it's pretty, pretty gross. Um, and then you touched on this, the pesticides and herbicides in our food. Um, glyphosate is one otherwise known, um, oh, I just blanked. Glyphosate, it's a chemical that's used, it's a weed killer. Um, and it's used pretty, pretty uh, um, widely. It's pretty widely used. It's a chemical that disrupts a protein pathway that only plants possess. And so it inhibits the plant growth and the plants that are split. Oh, it's Roundup. Thank you. Um, the plants that are sprayed with it die. Um, but there's a big debate about going on, on about this because glyphosate has been used for 40 years, long time, um, and it's really common. You know, you can buy it at Lowe's or any kind of home maintenance store and, and spray it all over, you know, your yard. And, and so they claim that it's safe um, because it doesn't interrupt the pathways of animals but really, is that really the case? How is, it, how is it playing out? Things they say, oh, it doesn't have any side effects. 
side effects makes it sound, you know, when you take a medicine or, and it says, oh, these are possible side effects, somehow it makes it seem much more, mm, nothing to really worry about. Those are just side effects, possible side effects. But they're really effects, right? It's possible things that are going to happen or that could happen. So glyphosate um, is, is one of those chemicals. Is, the, is it really safe? All of the testing for many, many, many of these chemicals go on behind closed doors. And the results are only available to regulatory bodies. They're not available to the public. So somebody else is saying, oh yeah, that's safe. But the information isn't made available to the general public. So how can we, it's very difficult to make choices on our own about these things. When I think about animal testing, I th typically think about lab mice. And so how is glyphosate affecting lab mice? We don't really know because that information is not available. Um, but how is it affecting other animals that aren't like mice? The insects, the fish, those birds. You know, they have slightly different systems. So there are two options. We can get rid of glyphosate, but then it would need to be replaced with something else um, that doesn't have as much research done on it. Or we can go to methods of organic farming where they aren't going to use those kind of chemicals. So a major switch will need to happen in a, either kind of way um, for our agriculture. We've just become so used to using these sorts of chemicals. And then the chemicals that are added to our foods, there's Roundup, like this. This is an example that I give every year because, at this time because I'm thinking about the upcoming Maple Harvest Festival at Shavers Creek. So real maple syrup is made of just maple sap and then it's boiled down into syrup. Um, these back here are all a series of chemicals. Some of them say that they might contain, might, contain up to 2% real maple, and then that leaves the 98% of sodium hetamexophosphate and sodium benzoate and potassium sorbate, chemicals to preserve freshness, which of course is really important. That's one of those things that chemicals have made life safer for us over time in some ways, food preservatives, a lot less people get sick with botulism and other food diseases, and yet are there effects from these chemicals that we don't know yet um, or that we aren't made aware of? And it's not just food, it's also here. Um, talk with your partner for a minute. What are some reasons that you might say no to bottled water? Why, should, why might you say no to bottled water? Why might you say no? Uh, companies like Nestle stealing water from Native American tribes? Yep. Thank you for mentioning that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm pretty sure that if you leave bottled water sit for too long, chemicals from the plastic seep into the water, so then you drink that. Yep, sure do. 
Yeah, have you ever gotten in your car after a warm day and grabbed that bottle of water and then like, oh man, it tastes like plastic. That's funny. Oh, except it's not. That just means the chemicals from the bottle have leached into your water. It's gross. Yes. What else? When compared to like sink or kitchen water, it's a lot more expensive, like per unit. Yeah, for sure. It can be up to a thousand times more expensive per bottle than tap water. Um, it, it's even more expensive even now than gasoline when you start to start to really, you know, depending on the size of bottle you're using and yeah. Yes. Um, I don't know, I feel like I don't really have control on how this plastic is disposed, so I'm not sure if it's being burned or I'm not sure what it's being used for. So therefore, yeah. I not having direct control of what I'm doing with said thing makes it so I try to stay away from plastic water bottles. Yeah, brilliant, thank you, yeah. So lots of reasons, anything else? Anybody have another point? Yeah. Well, I was gonna say, I know Dasani add salt to their water in their water bottles, and I learned that a little while ago, because I think they sell it mostly at airports and community, or sorry, amusement parks, so that people will keep buying it because they get thirsty. Oh, isn't that interesting? Which brings me to the point, um, did you hear all that? They're adding salt so it makes people thirstier, so then they buy more, so then that's intriguing. Um, which brings me to the fact that there are fewer regulations on bottled water than there are on tap water. People, there are many more regulations on the quality of tap water than there are regulating bottled water in the United States. So lots of reasons to avoid this, and yet it's so prolific. I walked into a hotel in Florida several years ago with my kids and the guy behind the counter said, uh, how many bottles of water do you want? I was just checking in, like I, I said, well, is the tap water not safe to drink? He said, oh no, it's fine. And then he goes, so you don't want any? I was like, no, I don't want any. He goes, you're not from here, are you? And I was like, well, no, obviously I'm staying in a hotel. Anyway, um, but it's, it's such a part of the culture, the assumption that, oh, these visitors to this hotel, they're going to want the fanciness of bottled water, um, or that it's a, a cultural thing wherever they live, that bottled water. So those are things, you know, the food and the water that we put in our bodies. And then there's the stuff, as Daria mentioned, the stuff that we put on our bodies. So all of these, the creams, the products, the lip balm, the sunscreen, the body lotion, the saving, shaving products, cosmetics, hair products, makeups, concealers, aftershaves, perfumes, colognes, lots of things. It's on average, on average, um, females use 12 different products, either daily or regularly. And each of those products probably contains at least 12 or so ingredients. So 144 chemicals, which chemical could be water, but it could be also something else. Males typically use six products. Um, and they come so easily, right? We just go and we get them off the shelf and then we put them into our medicine cabinets and then we put them on our skin. Our skin is the largest organ on the body. 16 square feet of skin. It is absorptive, which is the reason that like nicotine patches and other medicines that are, can be applied to the skin, you know, that triple antibiotic ointment you put on the cut, it works because it's getting absorbed into the skin. Those cells comprising the outermost layer are almost exclusively supplied by oxygen. So it's absorbing the tiniest stuff. Pretty amazing. And so this website, if you're curious, you can jot down this website and it will tell you. You can put in, I use Neutrogena cream, blah, 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 whatever kind, and it will tell you how safe your, your products are. 
Personal care products are, are created with over 10,500 different ingredients, some of which are known or suspected carcinogens, toxic to the reproductive system, or they're known to interrupt the endocrine system, which is this. Whoops, which is not that. Which is gonna be someplace in the future, hold on, okay. So, the, but there's no pre-market safety testing required for the industrial chemicals that go into personal care products or as the chemical industry as a whole. Less than 20% of those 10,000 chemicals are assessed for the effects on the body. So how many of them are dangerous? How many of them? Over the 36 years, the industry panel has rejected only 11 ingredients that are unsafe in cosmetics. And by contrast, the European Union has banned hundreds of chemicals from their cosmetics. So why do we choose? Why do we choose to use this stuff on our bodies? I'd like you to reflect on this video. Right? 99% of the products that we use today didn't exist with my grandparents' time, maybe even in your grandparents' time. And so this part of the course was particularly moving for a young woman named Caitlin when she was sitting in your seat in Baisai, and she wrote this. She says, as a woman in America, I was taught that makeup is supposed to be a symbol of feminism and beauty and I began applying it as soon as my parents allowed. I welcomed it as part of my womanhood. However, in recent months, I have begun to see the ridiculousness of it as it is used to create an alternate identity. For you, years, I have used it to make my face look better while what I was really doing was hiding or creating a mask to hide behind. My makeup allowed me to live a lie. So I finally decided to do something heroic, namely to remove makeup from my routine. This has meant convincing myself not to go to the makeup bag if I feel like my face is particularly unimpressive or unattractive on a certain day. So now in the morning, I stand in front of the mirror and look myself in the eyes to take in what is actually my face. I tell myself that this face holds heritage, history, genetics, and individuality. If I, along with others, cannot accept it for face value, then I am failing to appreciate the woman I am. Walking around all day without any makeup has been an enlightening experience. If I need to rub my eyes or if it starts to rain all of a sudden, I need not worry about smudging the makeup and I can comfort myself in knowing that my current appearance is all me with no help. I have been forcing myself to maintain eye contact, confident, solid eye contact with others so that they too can take in an unenhanced face. And most of the time they accept it. 
It turns out my face does not need black lines and red accents, that it was all a culturally imposed theory. Yes, my face no longer belongs to the corporations selling artificial enhancers. I am reclaiming it and returning it back to its home, the earth. It turns out that nature, the nature that is me, needs no help from Maybelline to complete. And she made more changes too. This is Caitlin. In order to use less product and to distinguish her identity was not based on her looks, she also cut her hair as an experiment and as a practice of awareness. So Caitlin's story is that she questioned, she reflected, she felt something, and then she made a choice. So she is our first case study of this, of this class period. Our second case study is this woman, Sarah Steingraber. She had bladder cancer at age 20. She decided to study cancer um, and geographical patterns to connect to environmental pollutants. So she was diagnosed at bl with bladder cancer in college at your age, and she suspected that there was a cancer cluster in her hometown and her family. So once in she remission, she began her lifelong exploration of the environmental links to cancer, chemicals, and human health. And she wrote this book, Living Downstream, where she investigated things like this, maps where she could see that bladder cancer cases were higher in these regions where there was, where is red. What she discovered is that those areas that are red also allow arsenic-based pesticides. And that arsenic is, is also connected, it is connected to these cases of bladder cancer. So she was the first one to start linking the cases of what's happening to the people to what's happening and being used in the environment. She wrote this next book called Having Faith, An Ecologist's Journey to Motherhood, because it's a memoir of her own pregnancy and also an investigation of fetal, the baby's toxicology, what's happening with chemicals in the body reveals the extent to which environmental hazards now threaten each stage of environmental development. And then also, she went on to see about chemicals found in breast milk, which include things like pesticides, dry cleaning fluids, cosmetic additives, termite poisons, flame retardants, toilet cleansers, perchlorate, and BPA. A lot of those might be familiar to you. Perchlorate is actually a propellant for rockets and fireworks. Now, how in the heck would that get into breast milk? It turns out that they also use it to control static electricity in cereal bags. So they put it on the inside of the bags of cereal and then, and then fill it with cereal so that your, your cereal isn't stuck to the plastic when you open it up. So we have to make a choice, right? We have to know, I did link, I, I'm not trying to scare you out of having children, and I'm not trying to scare you out of breastfeeding those children. Obviously, I've done both. Um, I did breastfeed all three of my boys because there is still proof, there's still research that's done that says that breast milk is awesome. It's better than the chemicals or what's put together as infant formula, um, but you have to make your own choice. This is, again, about awareness. Um, it becomes an obscene dilemma, right? You have to choose. So in breast milk, there's all kinds of antibodies that help the babies to ward off things like ear infections, stuff like that. There's also a lower risk of having asthma or allergies or infections or diarrhea with breast milk. 
I've put a pretty good article related to this in the week eight module, if you choose to check it out. So Sandra's story, she didn't stay quiet about what she discovered. She was diagnosed, she questioned, she studied, and she chose to act, chose to inform other people about what she's discovered. Here's our third case study, Theo Colburn. She was a sheep farmer. She's very interested in animals. She also is a pharmacist, interested. Obviously, pharmacy is a study of chemicals and how they impact the body. Um, and so when she turned 50, she discovered that everything that she was caring about, these animals, were connected. And so she started researching what was happening in the world of chemicals and pharmaceuticals, particularly related to, uh, related to animals. And so she discovered that there were emasculized river otters. That means that the males were not fully male anymore. Male bass with ovaries, male gulls were being feminized, shrunken gator penis. There's all kinds of things that are connected and in fact, here we can watch this short clip of a news story about this. And finally this week, scientists and activists reported this past week that more than 80% of the male bass fish in Washington, D.C.'s major river are now exhibiting female traits such as egg production because of a toxic stew of pollutants. Intersex fish probably result from drugs such as the contraceptive pill and other chemicals being flushed into the water, and they've been found across the U.S. The Potomac Conservancy, which focuses on D.C.'s river, called for new research to determine what was causing male smallmouth bass to carry immature eggs in their testes. Vicki Blazer, a fish biologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, says early evidence pointed to a mix of chemicals commonly used at home, as well as those used in large-scale farming operations causing the deformities. The suspect chemicals mimic natural hormones and disrupt the endocrine system, with young fish being particularly susceptible. The chemicals could include birth control pills and other drugs, toiletries, especially those with fragrances, products such as tissues treated with antibacterial agents, or goods treated with flame retardants that find their way into wastewater. Blazer also pointed to runoff from fertilizers and pesticides from agricultural areas. About 5 million people live in the greater Washington area, and 90% of them get their drinking water from the Potomac. And there's evidence that the anomaly is not confined to the Potomac. A report last year by the U.S. Geological Survey found intersex fish in a third of 111 sites tested around the country. So it's not just, here's the slide I thought was coming earlier, it's not just in fish. The endocrine system is what's moving the hormones that are in our bodies too endocrine system is all about the hormones. And so now man-made chemicals are acting as hormone mimics, which affect all these different glands in our bodies, which then send all kinds of signals and chemicals around our bodies, um, whether they're actual things happening uh, or whether they are triggered by, by something fake, right? So this is a big deal, and there's this, scientists are warning of sperm count crisis in people as well as in the fish. Um, so there are big studies of thousands, like 26,000 men around the world, um, that they are measuring sperm count, and they are discovering that with men whose average age was 35, they are finding that there is lower sperm count um, as the men get older and older. One in five young men now have um, low enough sperm count to be concerning. And all of this has a result of what Theo Colburn started uncovering. She asked questions. She felt like something wasn't right. She became informed, and then she acted. She wrote the book, and now these studies continue. So I call this class the giant experiment. How do you feel about that? 
how do you feel about, well, why would I call it that? And how do you feel about it? Go ahead and talk to your partner. Does anybody have anything they'd like to add or say or bring up at this point? Giant experiment. So I said that you're just like providing us with information, but you don't really expect us to act a certain way on it. So the way we react to what you're teaching us is kind of the experiment in and of itself. Mm, interesting. Thank you. Does anybody have anything else like they'd like to say? Related to that. Mm. Giant experiment. So I want to bring up the fact that a lot of these things were, these chemicals were created with good intention, right? Of making the world a better place in some way, shape, or form. Um, and the effects were unknown in a lot of cases. People were not, I don't want to say that people, people are bad, right? They're not intentionally harming, at least the majority of people are not out intentionally to harm others. There are some corporations that even as long ago as the 80s, they knew that these chemicals were harmful, maybe not when they cre were created, but while they were being used, and then, and then they chose to hide that information. So there is corruption that's happening related to this. But the intentions at the beginning were good, trying to make the world a better place, a safer place, create you know, farming practices that were feeding lots more people. But something, some things have gone awry. So now the awareness that that's happened is something else that we have to work through. We need to figure out how to change our story. Right? And changing stories are hard. Um, so these three women chose to act. They're all willing to ask big questions. They were all willing to reach out. Like, why do we use makeup? Why is there bladder cancer and chemicals in my breast milk? Why are animals having more and more abnormalities? And so their common attribute then is courage, right? They asked hard questions. They said no to something that was big. They refused to be silenced by their fear. And so being able to feel pain about what's happening right now is really important because it can crack us open to something even bigger and better. So when I show you this, I want you to be empowered. I want you to think about you. Where is your courage? Where are your questions? What is your creativity? Sometimes on SRTs, I get students that say, well, I like the course, but she didn't tell me what to do. Or even people that say, I hated the course because she didn't tell me what to do. I can't tell you what to do. 
I am here as a guide to, to show you what's going on, and then it's your choice to act, to be empowered. And I love my role in that. So your pack back question for this week relates to that. Cultural revolution for the environment hasn't happened by trying to frighten people. What might happen if we act and encourage action from a place of love? Thank you, welcome back, and I hope you have a beautiful day.